Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us at the Writer's House. Um, if you've never been here before, welcome. I see lots of familiar faces, so welcome back. Um, my name is Arielle. I'm a senior at Penn, and I also coordinate the Feminism series, um, which seeks to do events about gender, about sex, about feminism. Um, and I'm so excited for this event today. Um, I started writing a column for the Daily Pennsylvania in my sophomore year um, about sex. And since then, it's been such a fascinating experience to deal with the pushback, the praise, the reactions, and the experience of writing about sex that I figured I would invite some of my favorite writers um, to join me in a conversation of like the role of sex in journalism. Is it an important thing to write about? Is it necessary? How can we make conversations about sex more productive in the future? Um, these are questions I can't answer, uh, but these lovely folks can. So um, maybe starting with Dan, if you could all introduce yourselves and sort of your stake in this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> My name is uh, Dan Reimold. I'm a journalism professor at St. Joe's University and a student newspaper advisor. And I uh, wrote a book a few years back called Sex in the University, Celebrity, Controversy, and a Student Journalism Revolution, taking a look at this larger trend and phenomenon that for the past decade or so uh, has been among the most um, kind of vibrant and controversial uh, phenomenon that has impacted student journalism and has made uh, some student journalists stars and also at the center of uh, various controversies and scandals. So I'm definitely curious to talk about this from a larger perspective. Um, my name is Lena Chen. Um, when I was an undergraduate at Harvard, I wrote a blog called Sex in the Ivy, which um, garnered a lot of media attention at the time and a lot of backlash, in part because while I was writing, there was also a student organization called True Love Revolution promoting abstinence on campus, and they were getting a lot of media attention at the time. And um, we were kind of, um, we were kind of uh, represented as opposite sides <laughs> of um, the sex debates that were happening in the mid-2000s about hookup culture and whether having lots of sex in college or talking about having sex in college was even a good idea. Um, and it was all related to the political situation at the time because the, the Bush administration was in power, absence-only education was being funded, and people were um, very much, uh, people from both sides were very much invested in having their viewpoints heard. And I got to be caught in the middle of that. So it was <laughs> an interesting experience, to say the least. I shared that experience. My name is <laughs> Julia Allison, and I was the sex slash dating columnist at Georgetown. I, I um, actually created their inaugural column. I'm not sure if they still have sex columns. They did not <laughs> like that very much. Um, it was very controversial. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. And it changed my life. I sold the rights to that column to Aaron Spelling Television. He was going to make a TV show. He didn't end up doing it, but it got me into the media. And I then went on to write for a lot of different places like Cosmo, Maxim, Men's Health, Elle, Newsweek. I did an internationally syndicated column. I wrote dating columns for years and years and years um, until I just couldn't take it anymore. And I quit, tried to write about <laughs> tech, and then called, got called by Bravo and said, we really want you to come on and do a TV show about being a dating columnist. And I was like, no, <laughs> I can't get rid of this. <laughs> It's just staying with me forever. So I did a, a reality show on Bravo called Misadvised. Um, and the concept behind that was that, oh, haha, ha, isn't it funny that this dating columnist doesn't have a boyfriend? Uh, I did not think it was as funny as they did. Um, and I was writing a column for Elle at the time called Guinea Pig of Love, which was really the grown-up version of my college sex column. And now it is the 10-year anniversary of um, my sex column and I'm feeling very old <laughs> and I'm hoping that things have gotten better in the climate that sex columnists aren't as, um, I don't know, I was saying earlier lynched as I was, uh, but who knows, I guess we're going to find out today. To be determined. <laughs> <laughs> And with that, my name is Kelsey McKinney and I'm a senior at the University of Texas. And my my stake in this whole game is that I instigated and instituted our like premier sex columns. Um, we had had some before that, but these are the first that kind of got campus attention and got both media and campus backlash. So I was both the editor of the first run of those and then the, the rejuvenation of them. And I am one of the sex columnists. So I play both roles. 
Fantastic. So, um, so Kelsey and I are current sex writers. Lena and Julia are sort of the pioneers. We're, we're the inheritors of your legacy. We're the um, grandmothers. And Dan over there is uh, was once described as um, like the foremost sex column scholar. In America. Yeah, you, uh, USA Today thought it was worthy research. Gawker thought it was a strange dude looking at sex columns all day. So depending on how you look at take it. Your yeah. pick, yeah. Take your pick. Take your pick. So one of the first things that I wanted to talk about, because I think it's it's really important in sort of all of our stories, is this question of um, anonymity uh, versus having your name linked to some of these things. Um, so something that's interesting about Kelsey's column is that um, her name isn't on it. So you would never know by Googling Kelsey that she writes this kind of stuff. Um, but I know that both Lena and Julia have sort of been uh, haunted maybe by the fact that their bylines are attached to their name. Um, is that something that we think is going to change ever? Um, I mean, for me, it was a very interesting experience because I wrote a blog, so I was not beholden to an editor, and it wasn't something that was being published in a student paper. And originally, when I started this blog, it was really something only my friends knew about. It sort of spread virally before we had an idea of what viral meant. I mean, this was back when people like had no idea what Twitter was, and we're just starting to use Facebook. So it was a very different climate than it is today, where people are much more tech savvy and reputation um, aware. Um, in my case, I never protected my identity because I wasn't really ashamed of what I was writing. I didn't think that people were going to react so poorly. Um, I came from a fairly conservative Asian community in the suburbs of Los Angeles, and I was always under the impression that the East Coast was this liberal haven. <laughs> I know it's, it seems very naive nowadays when I think back to my 20-year-old um, self, but that was my conception of Harvard. I, I thought these are all very progressively minded people, um, certainly when it comes to issues of gender and sexuality. And I was, quite honestly, very surprised by the blowback. Um, I, I do want to mention that like the true, the true Love Revolution people, the abstinence group, they got just as much criticism as I did. And I think it's because people are very personally invested in the topic of, of sexuality. So it wasn't even as if they were the ones who were the most critical of me. Um, I, ha I dealt mostly with really misogynistic comments and people who are trying to attack my friends and my roommates and my partners and my, you know, people in my life. Um, so that's why, in retrospect, I wish I'd stay anonymous, to protect the people in my life mm -hmm. who had to deal with the repercussions of my writing. Um, but nowadays, I think people have just become completely, um, complete, completely paranoid about their reputation and like sort of gone to the other extreme where <laughs> A lot of times, yeah, you're afraid to do things under your real name on the internet because you don't want to deal with those repercussions. And you see this not just in journalism, but you see this with mm -hmm. you know, teenagers who are starting to come of age and figure out things about their sexuality. And when they blog about things on Tumblr or when they post things on Facebook, they deal with an enormous amount of blowback from their peers, um, the extent of which I don't even personally comprehend because it was not like that for me when I was growing up in high school or um, even in my early college years. Kelsey, so. has, has this question been sort of weighing on you and the other people who are writing for the Daily Texan? Yeah, so we, our columns are set up, we have four sex columnists and they all have alliterative names. So we have Sexy Sally, which is like a straight female perspective. She's single. We have Fabulous Frank, who's a gay male perspective. We have C Committed Caroline, which I write. Um, <laughs> and then we have not, Virgin Veronica. <laughs> who's a 22-year-old straight virgin. Wow. Um, yeah. yeah it's, Texas, it's, though. So. Texas, yeah. Can't so that, that And that kind of plays into why we decided to do ours anonymously. Is we, our decision was kind of twofold. The first was that two of, our, two of the four of us want to go into like very pro professional careers. They want to be lawyers and actuaries and doctors and these kind of jobs that get you a lot of attention and that you really need to be an upstanding citizen for. And they were uncomfortable in the state of Texas saying, yes, this is my name. Um, the second reason we decided is because the state of Texas is not exactly known for being open-minded, typically. And we kind of wanted to keep our identities separate from our, our writing identities about sex and just a little bit protective of what we, what we were going to say and what we knew would become topics in the future. I just think that's so smart. I, I wish, and I was saying this to the panelists earlier, that there had been a form given to me that would explain in great detail, as lawyers are wont to do, all of the repercussions of writing a sex column under your given legal name. 
I actually changed my name <laughs> afterwards because I just couldn't handle the, I mean, I couldn't, I didn't know what to do with the Google results. It was just like too much. And I felt so bad for my father and because I had put our name and he's a, he's a conservative lawyer. I just didn't, I didn't realize what was going to happen. Um, and I, the, if I, if I could go back and do it again, I would use a pseudonym. I, and I wouldn't necessarily not tell people it was me. In fact, I would. It would just, just for the Google search results and just to have a little bit of distance between your, your legal name. I mean, I had a lot of issues with, and Lena did too, with stalkers. I had people looking at my parents' property records. I had people contacting my parents, contacting my boyfriends. Um, just doing all kinds of things that were really just not fun to deal with and no human being should have to deal with them just because they're writing about dating. You know, that just doesn't make any logical sense. Um, and, a, and a pseudonym would have, would have protected me yeah. and it would have protected my, my family. Yeah, I, it's, it's so interesting to hear about you and, and Lena and all of the horrible consequences you suffered from this column. But I know, Dan, something that you highlight in your book is the fact that writing a sex column can also come with this sort of cult of celebrity. Do you want to talk about some of the benefits that you've, that yeah, you've heard about? I mean, well, it was one of the most interesting parts to me is I, I keep uh, something called College Media Matters, which is the, the country's top student press blog. And part of the reason, kind of the underlying rationale for writing the book was that literally every few days, I would find myself blogging about a new blow up or uh, attention grabbing headline that was made by a sex column. It's one of the few uh, situations in student journalism in which the student writer is the star <laughs> even to a greater degree than the publication for right. which he or she is writing for. Um, <laughs> and along with the controversies, I mean, uh, Julia was at times literally called out for making Georgetown no longer Catholic. I remember one <laughs> talking to a Boston University student who wrote a sex column there for the student newspaper was called into a priest's office on campus and was told that everyone on campus was praying for her soul. Mm -hmm. But yet at the same time, the students would write and get hundreds of Facebook friend requests, mm -hmm. um, uh, anonymous emails to say, meet me in the library at 2 a.m. I'll fulfill all your fantasies. Mm -hmm. um, you know, tons of opportunities to write lots of press <laughs> attention. Um, and it became this interesting phenomenon. Do you break what are considered many of the, the tenets of student journalism, which is to not even use anonymous sources, you know, unless it's it's truly worthy in a you know a really controversial story, to write about what most consider to be pretty inane topics, um, but the attention follows, and so it has been kind of an interesting up and down from the students who've written about it. Many have gone on to very interesting careers, but suffered a lot of. Google prints that are kind mm -hmm. of embarrassing and consequences on campus. No, I just so want to say one thing about the stardom thing. I think for me, if I'm going to be really honest, it was a very heady time at the beginning when I was getting a ton of press attention from national media outlets, and I had not started the column to get attention. I just started it because I wanted to talk about dating uh, like at parties, and I needed an excuse to do it. <laughs> um, and so it was a, I, my ego went like just that was what happened and it ended up being just really bad for me personally and my development as a healthy human being and my development as a journalist because I did get ca caught up in it. I was very much like, oh, I am, I'm the star. And, um, and it was a very long fall down to, you know, working as a working journalist and getting back up there. And I, there is one way to look at it, which is, yes, I got a lot of opportunities from it. But the other way is that I, I would have done well anyway and probably a little bit steadier and probably a, a more natural course that would have led to better journalism in the end. That's such an interesting point. And I know, Lena, we were just talking, you've sort of given up on writing about sex altogether, at least for the foreseeable future. Do you want to talk about that? Um, yeah. Well. I guess I, I, I've had a sort of bizarre change of heart over the last few years. It's not entirely voluntary. Um, I started with personal writing, and then when I um, met my partner in 2008, um, wow, Jesus, <laughs> I'm dating myself, aren't I? Um, when I met, I met my partner in 2008, um, I decided that I was not going to write about my personal sex life anymore. I kept him anonymous, and I wrote about him a couple of times, and unfortunately, I don't know what happened, but he was outed as being my partner, and it was a huge problem back then because he'd previously been a teaching fellow, 
of mine. And although we'd broken no rules whatsoever, and I was never going to take a class with him again, and even the professor who <laughs> he taught that class to me for, like, like n nobody cared, you know? It was a perfectly legitimate relationship. And Harvard had no problem hiring him as a lecturer when he finished his PhD. But in the meantime, there were people on the internet that were claiming that he had raped me that we had been in a relationship all along, even though we were involved in relationships with other people this entire time. People dug up his like personal information, his family background, like all these things. And I just realized if I want to have any sort of future, not just with this person that I care about, but if I want to protect my friends and my family, and my friends at that point were graduating into a recession, many of them were very concerned about whether or not they were going to be able to get jobs, period. They didn't want the type of stuff that was appearing on their Google results to appear. And I also felt a huge sense of responsibility to my readers, some of whom were underage, who were minors at the time, and they were having their personal information outed. They were receiving harassing messages from the person who was following my work and trying to like dismantle my entire identity. And I just realized this is not the direction I want my life to be going. And even if I feel that it's terribly unfair, um, for emotional reasons, for like my own mental health, I couldn't do it anymore. And it was a very difficult decision for me because um, for a long time I was involved in feminist and queer advocacy. I, I believe very strongly that there are certain issues that we should not shy away from talking about. But I think that there is also a fine line between holding those beliefs and practicing self-care to make sure you're not compromising your own ability to be able to do good work. And I got so strung out that I was no longer effective as an activist. Mm -hmm. And also, a lot of this stuff, like, it became like people were so focused on me and my personal life that they failed to see all the work I was doing that had nothing to do with my personal sex writing anymore. Because mm -hmm. after 2008, I wasn't doing that sort of writing. I was organizing feminist events, and I was um, doing advocacy around reproductive justice. But it was really hard to get people's attention on those issues because they still want to talk about me as a sex writer. <laughs> So about a year ago, I moved to Berlin, and I basically like have slowly been getting rid of all the contracts I've had in America. <laughs> and um, the work I do is social justice oriented now, and I, I'm working on projects related to homelessness and food security in America and in Germany. And it's very different from the work I was doing before, and I find it fulfilling for other reasons. And I still do my own writing, but it's not writing that I'm ready to publish at this time because I still honestly don't feel safe enough, especially in America. And, um, and one more thing, um, in 2008, that was the year that an ex-boyfriend of mine, who coincidentally is a pen alum, decided to put naked photos of me on the internet. And after that blow up, um, I, I definitely was exhibiting signs of like chronic post-traumatic stress. And that was one of the reasons that led me to move off campus from Harvard and really reevaluate what I wanted to do in terms of my writing and where I wanted my career to go. So those are things that we have a much um, better vocabulary for talking about nowadays, like revenge porn and cyberbullying and all these things. Mm -hmm. But back when it was happening, um, it was a very rare situation. There weren't lots of people you could go to to ask for help. There weren't legal you know, means to prosecute or anything. And there's, there still isn't. But um, that's one of the things that has changed a lot. And I'm glad to see more awareness around it. Um, but even now, I would caution anyone who wants to go in that direction to keep in mind that you're not just putting your emotional welfare on the line, potentially, but you're putting the emotional welfare of like people in your life on the line. Because oftentimes, when we're doing personal writing, it's about our experiences with other people and our relationships with other people. You know, it, it really continues to baffle me that for something as sort of almost mundane as sex, there's so much outrage and people are so personally inflamed and offended that you would want to talk about it. It's, it's incredible, actually, how much backlash there was and continues to be about something that everyone does, you know? Um, but by the same token, there's so much interest in it from, from a readership perspective. Um, I mean, you can open any general interest magazine and there's a sex section, you know? You can, you can open any online journalism uh, you know, source and, and find something about sex. Um, Huffington Post this this Friday is starting a new series where they get sex columnists to sit around and talk on HuffPo Live <laughs> as a weekly feature. I mean, the interest is incredible, um, and yet there's this this other side, which is that 
you know, readers want to read it, but they want to react in a way that's completely outraged. Um, like, Kelsey, you, you're you the only one here who has experience um, editing or, or inventing this sort of sex feature. Right. Was this something that you had to reconcile, the fact that your your readers wanted it and wanted to read about sex, but you, you can expect that there's going to be some sort of readership backlash? Yeah, it's definitely something we took into consideration coming the state of Texas teaches abstinence only education. Most freshmen at the University of Texas have never had a sex ed class. And if they did have one, it was like telling them not to have sex until they get married, honestly. Um, the first sex ed class I had was as a freshman in college. Um, and so that's part of the reason that we started the sex blogs. And that's part of the reason that we went in the direction that we went is we wanted to say, you know, here's a group of 50,000 students who have not been taught anything about sex. And we want to be able to yeah. say, okay, like let's have a conversation about like what is oral sex because there are kids on this campus that don't know. Like what is like contraception and how do you use it? Because there are kids on this campus that have never been taught it. And so we wanted to kind of start this conversation. And when we were building the blog, there we knew that there would be we knew it would do really well. So as an editor, I had like access to the analytics, right? I can sit there and watch the Google count. Um, and it was amazing the difference in when you say like, oh, we're getting a new football coach, how many viewers <laughs> you have on the site. And when you say sexy Sally likes oral sex more <laughs> on the site, it's incredible. I mean, I would be sitting at my computer and we would have a thousand live viewers on the site, which doesn't sound like a lot, but for a daily student newspaper that gets yeah. I mean, maybe a hundred viewers with a good story, like live, mm -hmm. a thousand's huge, you know, and that's just an interest. So I knew it would do well, and that was part of it. I won't say that it wasn't. Um, we said, you know, we know this will do well. We know it will spark interest, and we know that it will get people to care. Like, people will talk about it. And I do hear, I mean, every once in a while I'll be walking around and I'll hear someone, like, say, oh, did you read, like, Sexy Sally's, mm -hmm. Sally's column last week. I had people coming up to me because I'm kind of, as an editor, I was kind of the face of the column set. So I was the one that reporters would call to ask questions to. And I was the one that people kind of knew was leading the shindig. And I would have my friends come up and say, just tell me who Sexy Sally is. <laughs> and I'd be like, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you. Like, it's, that's part of the deal. And they would be like, no, no, but you can tell me. I'm not going to tell anyone else. But I'd be like, no, I'm not. And so there's, there is kind of a little bit of both there. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And I, it seems like it's definitely harder to attack a column that is faceless. You mm -hmm. know, Sexy Sally is a mysterious, faceless, depersonalized She's a entity. Yeah. So I, in one sense, it seems like just the an anonymity of it makes it mm -hmm. harder to attack. Um, but Dan, when, when you're hearing Kelsey and I talk about our experiences sure. versus hearing Lena and Julia talk about their experiences, um, do they sound different to you? Does it seem like things have changed or have things mostly stayed the same? Yeah, I think there's there's a, a sort of a mainstreamification going on in which it is, if not considered more acceptable, just kind of more understood that when you pick up the paper in any given mm -hmm. semester, you know, the administrator might be, uh, you know, kind of grimacing <laughs> as they page through. But the more expectation that there's going to be a sex column or even we're going to see in the next week a plethora of full-blown student sex issues in student newspapers, often time to Valentine's Day, mm -hmm. um, right. even at times uh, various sex features and things running more and more. So there is more of that mainstreaming. I think there's also more of a sense of, I think what Kelsey touches on, like the value of having these columns. Uh, as much as they're kind of giggled at, and again, if you go on any student newspaper website right now and look at the top five most popular pieces, <laughs> most likely a sex piece from 2011 will be at the top. Yeah. I mean, that, yeah. that's how popular <laughs> these things are. Um, and so along with that kind of scandal aspect or whatever people are Googling in the dead of night and finding these things, there's also value in that no one is talking about this. There might be discussions in certain you know, gender studies classes, but as we know, when the adult outlets try to write about what students are doing in their sex lives at colleges, they're often getting it wrong. And I know you guys at Penn know this a lot, even when the New York Times try and dives in and you know, says this is what kids are doing nowadays. The columns are not only providing the education, but they're doing it in a language, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and with kind of a peer discourse that I think can be really helpful, you know, in leading to a greater understanding of what is actually happening in the campus sphere, while at the same time getting people talking. And I think right. there's more of an understanding of that, but yet I would still label you brave for putting your name out there. You know, you're looking yeah. at probably the most prominent named student sex columnist in the country. 
along with uh, the writers at maybe at UC Berkeley and Stanford. And so there's a lot to be said for that. There's still sort of a pioneering status mm -hmm. to all of us. You are very kind, um, and uh, kind, kind not just because of that that last bit, but but also kind for sort of like reasserting the value of mm -hmm. writing about mm -hmm. sex. Um, and this is this is sort of the question that this whole discussion is hinging on, right? Like, is it actually valuable or important to have sex mm -hmm. in journalism? And I think there are lots of ways you can you can answer that. But it seems like what you're saying and what Kelsey's saying is that mm -hmm. just by virtue of the fact that you know we're a repressed culture and we don't talk about this still mm -hmm. means that writing about it is important. Would, would you guys agree with that? Yeah, well, I, I have a really, I've had a really interesting perspective on this. I started out when I was, when I was a very young girl, maybe 10, 11, I read The Feminine Mystique, and I was this like adamant feminist. I literally crossed out he's and wrote she's in the history textbooks at school. It was like a very time-consuming process. <laughs> and um, so I went in, so I had this very interesting dynamic. When I went to Georgetown, my mother pr made me promise I wouldn't turn into a Catholic and be like really conservative. And um, and I, I, you know, being so young, I didn't have any other frames of reference for sexuality. So when I was confronted with the sexual mores of that campus, in as much as you can make a generalization for any given campus, but this was a pretty homogenous culture, I will tell you. Um, birth control was not allowed on campus. Uh, condoms were not sold on campus. Um, it was very, very, very common to be judgmental about sex. And I simply thought that that's the way things were. And I was um, more liberal than the average student there, but in comparison with what I now know, I live in San Francisco now, I've been to Burning Man three times, <laughs> holy shit. Like there's a whole nother world out there that I had no idea was going on. My friends at Wesleyan knew it was going on, but I didn't. And so I was the, the sort of like the leading force at Georgetown about sex and dating, but I didn't know what the hell I was doing. So there are two interesting perspectives there. One is, in a sense, it's it's great, you know, a student talking to students about their own stuff. It, that makes sense. In another sense, I look back and I I now, I, I was actually quite ashamed of being a sex columnist for quite some time. I wouldn't let anyone call me that. I'd be like, I'm a dating columnist, a relationship columnist, or just a columnist would be best of all. Um, and now I'm feeling into, in the last year or two, coming back to um, letting go of that shame about talking about sex, talking about relationships. That's real. That it has value. And I am so tired, and I've said this you know, a hundred times, and I'll say it a hundred more, men who write about sports get a great deal of respect in the journalism profession. And women who write about sex do not. I've experienced it firsthand. They are in the pink ghetto. And that's unacceptable. Because sex and dating affects everyone. Sports does not affect me. <laughs> it never will. And, um, and I'm teasing a little bit, but like not really. At the end of the day, these are really crucial issues. And the shame around them, and you know, this is stuff that's coming out now with Brene Brown's work on shame and, and the, um, the sort of mass understanding of this. I mean, I now feel that it is, it, there's a, a moral issue behind students speaking about this. And, and also adults, not that students are adults, but you know, um, older people, <laughs> um, giving it, it the attention it deserves and then coming in and, mm -hmm. and hopefully helping these students to understand. If someone had sat me down and said, like, let's, let's talk about what's really going on here. There's a lot of shame at Georgetown about sex. Let's talk about that. That's real stuff. So I feel now a, a, a circle, like there's a beautiful circle, and I'm starting to look back into it. Mm -hmm. How can I be of service to this next generation or to the, you know, any generation, really? There's shame at all age levels. Absolutely. Um, and you, you are still writing. Yes, I, I actually just got, a, I just got a book deal um, to do a book called Experiments in Happiness. I thought happiness, no one can get upset about this. <laughs> you know, and I actually, that was really my mindset. I actually went through and I was like, what is a not controversial topic? Because you, know, you get tired after a while. Um, and, and, but part of happiness, in fact, anyone who's been through a breakup <laughs> or anyone who's in a fight with their significant other knows that if that's not going well, nothing's going well. So um, that is a big part of it. And I'm now in the process currently, literally right now, it's like, how am I going to handle sex and relationships in this book? Because mm -hmm. I don't want it to be 
put with a pink cover and shoved into the dating self-help books and then me dismissed as a human being and as, an, and, and as a brain. I'm just dismissed. I'm actually quite tired of that. Um, happiness might not be the most serious subject, but men get to write about it and get some serious credibility. So I want it to be a part of it. And I, th I think I want to go stealth with it, but I think that that's unfortunate. And I hope that I don't always have to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So I was just going to say, I also think, I mean, we're talking a lot about um, sex calmness who are sexually active and writing about their sex lives right now, but I think it's equally important that we address the fact that the one of the perspectives we don't hear often is people talking about their experiences being virgins or abstinent. Um, and I think it's really great that you guys have a student who's writing about that because it's funny, when I was writing Sex in the Ivy, one of the few people who I really could relate to, surprisingly enough, was the president of True Love Revolution, mm -hmm. someone with whom I had like zero in common with when it came to our sex lives. But because she was also someone who was very outspoken about the sexual decisions she made, um, mm -hmm. people found that it was quite easy to be judgmental toward her. And at one point, there was a New York Times article um, on which I think she was like the cover image even of this like New York Times Magazine article and they also interviewed me and both of us ended up looking essentially like caricatures <laughs> of ourselves. I was described as a small Asian woman and then her and her, um, her co-founder, like her co-founder was photographed with a cross, they're both Catholic um, and religion definitely played a role in their decision to abstain from sex before marriage but I just thought it was so unfortunate that we really only have these two extremes to talk about and it doesn't really matter what you're saying about sex when you're writing about it people tend to think oh this person's perspective means that like if I do anything that defers from where their path is this is like a commentary on my, my own sex life and I think this just goes back to the issue of like there's a lot of shame around sex and people when they're not comfortable with their own sexuality that ends up being projected onto others. And that happens sometimes, like, if you have, like, a gay sex columnist writing about their experiences. I wish there were transgender students who mm -hmm. felt like they could be comfortable enough to write about their experiences. But, you know, that doesn't happen because the second someone puts their personal life on the line, other people examine their own lives in comparison. And that's just really unfortunate because I think that there's not enough voices out there and you know sex in the city and like girls and all that like I think it's great that like there's representations of sexuality but they're not very diverse representations no, no, no. by far they're like young affluent white female representations um, you don't hear much about the queer perspective unless you're watching the L word you know and that's not on TV anymore <laughs> so I don't know what the new L word is you know um, looking yeah, looking on HBO. I mean, I mean, so I, I, I think it's, I just think it's great that you guys like really like yeah. made this decision that you're not just going to have one view that you're going to mm -hmm. try to be as representative as possible. But I know something, uh, Kelsey, you and I mm -hmm. talked about earlier is that in your quest to be diverse, it was incredibly hard to find a straight man to yeah. write a sex column. Yeah. Yes. Which, which on one hand is like, well, the straight man perspective is, you know, what we hear all the time, like, we can give that one a break. But, but on the other hand, it is sort of weird that, by and large, sex columnists are women, uh, mm -hmm. or if they're men, they're queer. So right. do you want to talk about that? Yeah, when we, when we sat down, me and the editor-in-chief of our paper, we sat down and we said, okay, what do we want? What perspectives do we want in this, in this column? And we had, like, eight. You know, we had, like, uh, and like by gender couples and we had you know we, we had all of these things that we wanted and we were like okay it's impossible to fill eight sex columnist slots and also no one is going to read eight sex columns a week <laughs> so we were like all right we'll pare down so we ended up we wanted a straight single woman a straight male attached or unattached we wanted a committed woman we wanted a gay perspective male or female and we wanted a virgin and the reasons we kind of did that were we thought that they were reflective of the UT community, and that was kind of our goal. So we do have a, I would say, a starting, startlingly high level of virgins as freshmen and sophomores in college because they've been taught abstinence, and they come from small towns, and they grew up religious, and they didn't have sex. And so they come into college, and they're questioning, like, is this okay? Is it not okay? How does someone have sex? Can I try to do that? You know, like, there are all of these kind of things that we we fought with, but we cannot fill the straight male perspective. When, when we s figured out our five, I said, okay, we'll start with the straight male because that will be the easiest. <laughs> because I was thinking, I was like, you know, I go to these parties and I hear all of these 
bros in their like polos talking about how much like talking about their sex lives. I was like, how hard can it be to convince one of them to write about it and write well? And we can't we can't find one. We've tried two or three. We've had three people write a single straight male perspective column um, only to either get scared and pull it or to not be able to handle having edits on their piece, which is not a thing you can do in journalism. So we've, we've lost three straight male columnists. So if you happen to have a friend at UT who's a straight male that wants to write, uh, let me know afterward. But we, we really have had a hard time. And I think a lot of it, I think a lot of it comes down to the status of sex columnists. They're typically women. It's typically women who write, write about sex. And I, at the University of Texas, I do think there's kind of a, the straight men are like, I don't really want to be associated with the, this idea. And it's only fascinating because the few straight single guys who mm-hmm. have written the columns that I had either interviewed or read their pieces achieve an A-list level stardom on right. campus right. that dwarfs anything like football star plus student government president <laughs> times a thousand and yeah. are often the studs on campus. Now, at the same time, though, they often seem to feel like they have to evoke a sort of crazy masculine persona. I remember yeah. one student at a California school wrote as his penis, uh, <laughs> which he called Little Joe Namath. And that was like his <laughs> stick. You know, and so there's that sense that I have to be the straight male and, and evoke that and be Mr. Big times a million. You know, and it, wow. and it almost becomes caricature and it's yeah. almost a shame. But, it, but beyond that, it tends to be women, heteronormative, mm-hmm. typically kind of in a middle class and sort of in a Carrie Bradshaw-esque right. mold, fading a little bit as the show's influence you know, goes away, but that was definitely the last 10 years or so. Right. And to be fair, we kind of, we put out an open call after the first week. We, like, ran all the first columns, the introductions, and then we said, okay, if you're a straight guy on this campus and you want to come work for us and write about sex, let us know. And we did get plenty of um, men who wanted to write something that was not a sex column about, <laughs> about the sex they were having. So there was kind of, we attracted the macho perspective, yeah. but we were like, we don't really, we're not interested in yeah. Just one point on the Carrie Bradshaw thing because mm-hmm. I know I don't. Does that still come up a lot? Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. To know if I was. So <laughs> it came up a lot for me. Like I can't. God. Oh my God. The number of times people. Oh, so you're like Carrie Bradshaw? Yes. <laughs> yes. That show was on ten years ago. <laughs> um, so one point on that. I used to think it was relatively innocuous. I was like, okay, it's. I really liked the show Sex in the City when I was in college. That's when I watched it. I enjoyed it, then I went and lived in Manhattan, and I experienced it myself. I literally dated one of Candace Bushnell's ex-boyfriends. I was like, I'm having this experience the whole way. (laughs) And um, now my perspective is actually quite different. I look at that show, and um, I'm trying to think if I should go so far as to say it's harmful. I might. I might actually go that far. I think it's it's harmful in that it really presented one perspective. And it looked like it was this, four and yeah. yeah, like yeah. it looked like four perspectives. It also, it, it, was, um, it was put out into the media like this is revolutionary, and it, and, it, and it probably was at the time. And now that I've had a whole new experience of um, this, this San, Fr- San Francisco sexuality, it's just it's just not a- enough. Uh, and, and I don't know if I'm being clear enough in that. It's just, it's very limited in sexuality. And I'm not just talking about partners, but like the way people feel mm-hmm. about connecting with other human beings. I mean, there just wasn't a lot of talk about spirituality. And I, I now see sex and relationships as deeply spiritual experiences. And I now have ways of relating to people, literally languaging to connect with them on the physical level that might look like penetrative sex, but usually doesn't. It actually is energetic sex, or it's touching. It's just so much bigger than Manolo's and a, and a <laughs> vodka Cosmo or whatever. It's just so much bigger, so much deeper. And it, and it makes me a little sad because I think I don't I don't watch girls. I, maybe this is like something that they're updating. I don't I don't know. <laughs> I don't watch girls either. I <laughs> and I think I mean, you know, again, whatever TV, like we can't get too mad at it. But it does seem like there needs to be like sex isn't just mechanics and that's the saddest thing I see it's like do this put this there it's like no this is a beautiful experience like this is how to connect with other souls and that is what I think is missing and that's the saddest part about 
a lot of the sex columns that, that I see and the ones that I wrote, frankly. It was like, should I, should the guy pay on the first date? It's like, I mean, yes, but, um, <laughs> but that's not really what it's about, is it? You know, there are masculine feminine dynamics and like, it's just way deeper than that. Yeah. I think it sounds like you need to get back to sex writing. But, um, so we've, we've been gabbing for so long. Um, does anyone have questions in the audience? Because we could we could talk all night, and, and we will later over food in our dining room. Um, but if anyone wants to ask a question now, yeah. And then later, of course, like we'll all go munch on food in the dining room, and you can talk to us one on one. So a good friend of the area, um, she's saying that you know she's graduating this year, and that she's not sure if the sex column here at Penn is going to continue. And you know, I sort of mildly entertain the idea of continuing, you know, giving a different perspective. Mm -hmm. But I'm, you know, pre-professional warden. You know mm -hmm. how? And so, in talking about anonymity, how do you guys feel like that plays out into what you write? Is there because there's some distance? Do you feel that you lose connection to some parts, or do you feel that the anonymity will allow you to talk about things you'd be afraid to talk about as your own, even if it were in such a you know disturbing climate and the reaction you might get? Mm -hmm. I think for, for me at least, and I know for our columnists, it does, it does a little bit of both, right? So you can say things that are a little more controversial, you can be a little more honest than maybe you would be if your name was plastered on it, and there isn't this element of fear that they've mm. both talked about, about is this going to come back to bite me in the future? Uh, at the same time, you can't there is kind of a benefit to people knowing that you're writing a sex column, I think, in that people give you ideas for free, mm -hmm. yeah, that's true. Um, which is <laughs> great. And you can kind of talk about your intensely personal and not worry about people figuring it out. Because I know for us, we have to kind of hide, like, OK, you can't describe the person that you had sex with because then mm -hmm. someone will know that it's you. Yeah. You know, and so there's, I think there's a little bit of both. Us. I think the way to, the way if I could do it over, I, so I would do a pseudonym, but then I would still mm -hmm. people would know. Like I yeah. loved. I mean, I would that's sit the, in the cafeteria the for hours with a notebook, being like, "Yeah, tell me more." Like I just loved. <laughs> that was why I did it. That's yeah. the real reason I did it. Um, I would never want to take that part away. That was the best part uh, of it. So it, that's what I would do. Where I you because it's not it that there really isn't a problem with like people knowing. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know anything can happen, but. Mm -hmm. That seems relatively safe to me. Um, I would just say that, you know, be careful about who you write about. I was always <laughs> very careful in my opinion. I always use aliases for everyone that I me hooked too. up with. But um, someone saw me and my boyfriend together on campus at some point, you know? And once his name was on a message board and once people claimed that he was raping me, you know, that never goes away. And mm -hmm. he's an academic. It makes it very difficult for him to get a job. Um, it was okay at Harvard because his professors knew him and knew that he was not a sketchy person, that he was a very, very good teacher. But it has been very problematic for me on many levels. And as far as writing about friends um, and roommates and stuff is concerned, I never even wrote about my friends' relationships, but simply by virtue of mentioning that I went to things with them, that became a liability. And so when you're writing about your sex life, again, it's really hard to divorce it from your relationships with other people, especially in college when so much of your formative experiences involves your classmates and your roommates and these people mm -hmm. who you're also learning about sex from. And that's what I really loved about my college experience, the people around me. And I was lucky to have people around me who were very supportive. But even the wonderful friends I had, after a while, the stress really weighed on them, especially when we were about to graduate and they were really concerned about what being associated with me by name on the internet would mean. But you know, I think that's mainly because we were women. I, I really think yeah, that. Yeah, I think that's entirely that possible. I, I really, <laughs> yeah. I don't know what it is, but yeah, it's just but yeah, you know what? more leeway. They also um, outed a lot of my, not outed, but like I had male friends who were gay, who were not completely out to their families, whose sexualities were, were written about by people who were essentially stalking me on the internet. And so those were concerns that I had um, that led to me not writing about sex anymore. But you know what? It could be very different for you. Um, and people's reactions to your writing could range. So it, you know, it, it's like you have to rely on your intuition a little bit. And I think in today's climate, if that sort of thing were to happen to you, I would suspect that a lot of people would understand that Google is not like 
a history book, you know, that there's a lot of stuff on the internet that is just not true. But that's something to keep in mind because I think um, one of the most important things is that you keep yourself feeling safe, um, not just physically, but like emotionally. And on a student campus, it can feel like a very small pond a lot of times. I think Arielle's doing it right in the sense that she's writing about, I think it's a great, great model in the sense that she's writing about a diversity of topics, but in a sort of elegant way that I think she'd be easily able to hold up to, you know, versus just, I'm going to write this and be scandal-tastic, you know, and then kind of look right. back at it and wonder what I was doing. As someone who, who, who does advise a student newspaper now and has at a few other publications whenever students come to me and ask, I would say, you know, do it right, but also own your student status. You know, you have this moment in time in which you can kind of be a sociological experiment, in which you don't have all the answers yet, but you can explore. Um, and so don't be afraid to simply shy away or think, I have to simply follow the Carrie Brad show. It's week seven, I have to write about threesomes now. Um, <laughs> you know, and there's times where I will not get what the students are writing. I still, it's part of kind of obtaining the student identity. You know, is a student newspaper for the entire campus community? Is it simply for the students? Is it for the outside community? Is it for training purposes? I think the sex column embrace is the best of that because it's student to student. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I still remember a student of mine at, at the University of Tampa where I worked and advised, uh, wrote about vijazzling. Um, yep, uh, kind of a lighted wow. landing strip, so to speak, um, you know, along the female genitalia. And I will still remember, it was sort of like watching the Zapruder film of the JFK assassination of our dean picking up the paper that week and oh looking back into the left. He just could not believe what he was reading the paper, but the students absolutely loved it. And there was a lot of talk on campus. And she kind of owned that and written about it in a sophisticated enough way. And, you know, she's able to hold that up to employers, hopefully, with other diversity of writing. So I do think you got to accept the student part. Yeah. Uh -huh. And if your Google prints are still five years down the road, only what you've done, you know, in yeah. school, that's more of a post-grad problem, you know. And so hopefully it's just a mix of what you've written at that point. And I think it's the best then of all those worlds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you, question over here. I wanted to ask, um, oh, do I have to use the mic? Mm -hmm. Sort of your opinion, especially not to single out you because you're a male, but I'm going to single out as a male. The conversation that happens around sexual assault on campus, I'm wondering all of your opinions about that. We've seen all the headlines and seems, I don't know, you talked about um, your advocacy for reproductive rights and that's sort of ahead of where I'm going. And I wanted to know your opinions, what you think about campus's response to sexual assault and also the conversation that happens around sexual assault and how it affects women. There are never enough conversations about it. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Maybe that's maybe a stupid thing to say, but um, I mean, you just have to have so many conversations, especially when they get no education, mm -hmm. no education. And I have to tell you, I mean, I was I was involved in Take Back the Night in, at Georgetown, and um, very very much an advocate of um, education in this realm because a lot of it is discussing uh, communication of boundaries and we as a culture suck at educating men and women and women about boundaries because part of it is how do you how do we as women communicate boundaries and how do we make sure we're safe and I'm now so so clear on how to do that but it took me till 32 to to really get micro boundaries to really be I mean so clear on feeling into the men and who they are I mean it took a long time and I'm sure there are ways of doing that faster and I'm sure there are ways of connecting with men, young men and young women in a better way than the way we do it because I know the way that it was done at least at Georgetown I don't think it was terribly effective mm -hmm. so I think there needs to be um, an overhaul in, in our sexual assault education in, in all, all across campuses. It's just, it's just too blunt. It's like a blunt instru instrument right now. It's not fine-tuned, yeah, if that makes I, sense to other people. Yeah, I completely agree with that, and I agree that we need to be talking about it more. There are never enough conversations about it. Um, I wanted to mention that like our paper, The Daily Pennsylvanian, had a beautiful, I, was it was a five-day spread? Three day, three day, four day. Four day. Okay, it was a multi day spread on sexual assault um, with just beautiful, really thoroughly investigative features. And what was so effective about it wasn't just that it happened day after day after day, but that it removed so much of the shame, I think, of this mm -hmm. experience because it highlighted so many experiences of sexual assault on campus um, in a way that's just that's just getting people to talk about it more, right? 
Um, but the other thing I wanted to say is that uh, one of my very early columns was about the issue of consent. And I remember having this conversation with my editor, like, I mean, it's, you know, it's on the opinion page, but it's not really like that extreme. Like my, my opinion is essentially that like our model of consent should be that yes means yes, rather than saying no means no. It should be like consent should be active, you know? And I thought this is gonna be so boring. Like everybody knows this, you know? And for more than a week, it was like the most read, most commented feature online with comments from people who were saying things like, I just don't agree. If you wear a short dress to a party, like you're asking for it. And like mm -hmm. these are these are Penn yeah. students, these are people who oh. are in our community who for weeks it was just getting comments like this. And it, it sort of floored me that something that I like so took for granted and didn't didn't write um, to be inflammatory at all had got so much pushback. So I think that like we just need to be talking about it more because to the, to the extent that people can still respond that way and think that it's totally legitimate is, is really horrifying. Yeah. yeah, I think that one of the things that um, has kind of changed since the time I, I was in school is that nowadays students are kind of taking matters into their own hands. I um, mean, at Yale with the Title IX case and everything, mm -hmm. you can see that there's no longer this assumption that your administration is going to protect you. I mean, I had a lot of friends in undergrad who were assaulted um, some of them were drugged even. Their rapists were never brought to justice. Mm -hmm. Even when they were, um, I mean, I have read some of the transcripts from the proceedings that were held with the administration behind closed doors and professors engage in shaming the victim mm -hmm. and bl asking the victim, well, how did you get yourself into this situation? And it's really unfortunate, but parents send their kids off to college thinking, oh, the college is going to act mm -hmm. as like this like, you know, paternal whatever <laughs> uh, figure. And that doesn't happen because a lot of times universities are afraid of liability. And maybe this is a controversial opinion, I don't know. But um, when I was writing my blog that was like a sex blog, it wasn't just about sex, it was also about mental health and depression and how I felt really alienated because my class background was not that of my, my classmates. And I had a lot of friends who were struggling with mental health issues. And whether it was mental health issues or sexual assault or whatever, when the administration thought that you might prove to be a liability to them by harming yourself or harming the reputation of the school, it was easier for them to suggest that you take an academic leave of absence than to find out why might this person not feel comfortable in a college environment? Why are they not going to class? Why are they sleeping in? Mm. Why are they going to mental health services all the time? You know, why are we subpoenaing their mental health records and using it against them in these meetings with them behind closed doors to determine whether or not they're allowed to return to campus, right? And these things happen all the time, everywhere across the country. I'm really glad that people are more aware of it now and that students are fighting back. But we also have to realize that this is not just about improving, um, improving young people's understanding of consent, which is something that should happen way before college. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And like as, as Kelsey, <laughs> yeah. yeah, as Kelsey yeah. said, you know, this is something that has to do with the way we learn about communicating right. with each other way before then, right? But by the time we get to college, you know, there should be some sort of education so that people know how to live together in a small environment and to treat each other like human beings with respect. But that behavior really needs to be modeled by adults, <laughs> by adults, you know, like we're adults too, sure, as students, but like by people who are there to guide us through our college years. And, you know, unfortunately that isn't always the case, but I think it's really great that there are students coming together from all schools and colleges talking about these issues and doing things to make themselves feel safer because they realize that that's what you have to do. You have to come together on your own, that no one else is going to do it for you, not even the university that you pay all that tuition money to. And that's the student, student media have really been a lead. I think it's a f yeah. fantastic question in the sense, I think besides, I would say sexual assault, um, suicide, uh, you know, which I know the, the Penn community knows at the moment, student debt, and maybe like deporting Justin Bieber, like at the moment are the biggest content drivers within college yeah. media right now. Uh, but isn't this interesting, and maybe just to raise the issue of just kind of something I find fascinating, you know, Ariel mentioned writing about the idea of consent. What's interesting is that you don't see that type of topic addressed a lot in the columns for, you know, whatever reason, the idea of sexual assault, sexual violence, that's seen as the news driver. So that tends yeah. to be the front page right. piece or like yeah. the DP Surviving Silence series that recently ran. Uh, let's check it out because it's really great. It's on its own website. So good. Um, 
you know, seen as kind of important news or something we need to get it in an objective investigatory way, and it doesn't find its way into a lot of columns, even though it definitely is such a, a driving yeah. you know, engine of what is happening in the college sphere and what deserves to be debated. And I don't know exactly what that uh, reason might be, why that separation exists. I think that's the sex in the city thing. Yeah. Like it didn't, it's going to be fun. It's, you know, not, it's not kind of cute and fun and lifestyle. Right. I think it's the cute and fun, and I think it's also there, I think college students are becoming more and more aware of like speaking on behalf of someone whose experience you don't have. And I know that like we had a lot of conversations because our paper ran an investigative um, sexual assault piece in, I think, November. And we had conversations as an editorial staff of, okay, do we have the sex columnists do something as well to kind of like go along with this? And the, the resounding vote was no. You don't have the columnists do something because that's not their experience. Unless you have, and we asked, we asked all of our columnists, like, have, have any of you had this experience and would you be willing to write about it? And luckily none of us had yeah. and so for us we we didn't choose to do that but I think one thing we see a lot at Texas and I'm sure at other schools it's very common as well is this idea that sexual assault is a it starts from a mindset right it starts from a mindset and a misunderstanding about what sex is and that is something that we are really trying to address in both of the news side and the more editorial lifestyle section is like when does someone want to have sex with you and when do they not and how can you how can you talk about another person or another person's body and how can you not and I think that's a really hot topic right now for student journalists. In, two, in 2011, if I met just the 30s, the, uh, Penn State, uh, the Daily Collegian, <laughs> launched a student sex column mm -hmm. for the first time in that paper's history, and it mm -hmm. kind of blew up big, both yeah. good and bad. Mm -hmm. Then the Sandusky scandal happened, and they mm -hmm. quietly put the sex <laughs> column to bed, thinking that we yeah. could not do both. Yeah. Then they relaunched it this past fall semester. The first piece, they, they did a Dick and Jane, two anonymous students writing, yeah. was on oral sex from the guy and gal's perspective and it remains the number one most popular piece on the website. So just kind of an interesting dynamic there. That there's that interest there, but it was felt that they couldn't talk about it when there was sort of that cloud hanging over a lot of the work they were doing in the news section. So it's kind of interesting, the coexistence in that sense, or in that case, not. Well, and I think one point that I think it's so great what you're doing, one point that comes up for me is this idea of it being uh, like really extreme, like sexual assault, rape. Like there's so much in right. between there that we mm -hmm. never talk about that is so relevant. Maybe you haven't experienced a, like a, a rape, but every, I, I don't want to say every, pretty much, pretty much every woman I know has experienced a like, oh, this feels like a lot. Like whatever's going on here, I don't know what to do with this thing. Even if it's just like a lot of slobber, yeah. right? And that might just be <laughs> your seventh grade experience or whatever. But, um, when, when I think about like the perfect sex column, mm -hmm. they're really addressing communication issues too. I mean, it's, yeah. it really is about how do you, etiquette, it's etiquette, right? Like basic etiquette. And I'll tell you a true story from a couple weeks ago, I was at a, a girlfriend's house who's a, a very, um, very liberal and actually qu almost quite famous actress. And I was saying something about safe words. And I said, oh, you know, Da, 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 this one date I went on and I said to the guy, well, here are my safe words. And we weren't even having sex. We were just making out. And she's like, oh, that's weird. Didn't he think you were weird with your safe words? And I said, no, that's awesome. <laughs> it's awesome to have safe words because that way you get to do whatever you want and he knows exactly what's okay and what isn't because you say the safe word. And she said, well, I just think guys would think that's weird. And she is a grown adult. And so I'm thinking to myself... <laughs> wow, um, this is the world I'm living in right now. And if we had columns yeah. that said, safe words are great, everyone should use them. They're not dorky. They mean you can do crazy <laughs> stuff, and you know it's okay because she didn't say the safe word, you know, or whatever. <laughs> he can have safe words too, you know? That's, that's fine too. So mm -hmm. I think that's what Seth's columns yeah. should also be, and it doesn't have to be so like, blah, no means no. I mean, that's great too. There's a lot in between. Right. Um, the past discussion over the last 10 minutes or so has um, kind of driven the point home that writing about sex, especially as a woman in this day and age, can kind of be a political act. Um, you don't just write about sex to talk about your awesome se sex life. You're just, you're putting it out there because it's important to talk about. And you, if you're spending the time doing the work and putting it out there, you've already made the decision that it's important enough to talk about. Um, so there can be this impulse as a sex writer to say, you know what, what the hell, why not? put it under my own name. I want to be proud of this. This is a legitimate thing to talk about. But as Lena said, you know, it, 
it does put you under the gun. It does put you, we're in, we live in a, in a society where um, you can come under fire, where it can affect your job situation, where people might go after your loved ones, your family, your friends. Um, and sometimes to be responsible to yourself, you have to back out of that and make the decision not to. Um, so when you're trapped in a double bind like that, just kind of posing to the panel, how do we go forward and make this a safe thing to talk about without throwing ourselves on the fire? Dan? <laughs> you, have the, you have the widest view of, like, you know, of everyone. I, I mean, it's, we're just two people. <laughs> I think I'll talk about it from the wider perspective, and then you guys can get off to the, the the active tips. I think the I think we're getting there in the sense that I do think there's power in numbers in that the amount of vitriol that Julia and a few other, if I can use the term, pioneers uh, received in the Sex and the City wake as they started the columns initially absolutely made them these politically polarizing figures. But I know from some of the young women and, and men I talked to, in some cases it wasn't even that they thought about it and decided they didn't want to be political figures, they just thought it would be fun to write about sex and they had not thought about any of those consequences. I do think there is more of a, a mainstreaming nowadays in which it's somewhat expected for these sorts of topics to show up a bit more regularly um, in student media in various forms. Um, and so I think there is kind of a, a step back and, and moving forward at the same time that's happening. Um, I, it only takes one column, though, to blow up, and that, that's often the controversies I'm seeing now. It's no longer, oh my gosh, these kids today are writing these columns. Mm -hmm. It's that this anal sex one just crossed the line. <laughs> you know, you're writing about sex during menstruation. No, you don't do that on our campus. And that's, so it's, you know, we're still kind of hitting those walls, uh, but I do think it's more kind of singular in that sense. I, I think we have moved forward a lot in the last 10 years. Yeah. You have to have a very strong sense of self. Um, and even then, I will say it's dangerous to feel like you're right about everything and to just do something because you think ideologically your position is superior to the people who are criticizing you. Um, the reason I say that, I had a lot in common with the president of True Love Revolution, who was celibate until she married her um, fiance, um, is because she was also standing up for what she believed in. I didn't agree with her. You know, but she wasn't coming to my dorm room, knocking on my door at the middle of the night, telling me not to have sex. And I wasn't, like, you know, doing the reverse to her. And I realized by examining that girl's experience and my own experience that a lot of this comes down to your personal um, sense of security in who you are and in, in your identity. I think part of the reason, I have to admit, that I was so deeply affected by the criticism I received is because I wasn't so comfortable in my own body as a young woman. I, I knew, you know, like, um, I knew that I was right, but it's different to, like, live that. Um, and it can become very difficult when you feel like it's you against the world. So for me, seeing this girl's experience, seeing that Janie was also receiving a lot of criticism for our fellow classmates, which is ironic. You know, she got criticized for having no sex. I got criticized for having too much sex, right? Um, you know, it, I, I, I ultimately had to realize it wasn't about me. Mm -hmm. You know, it was about the greater culture at large. It's very hard not to take it personally. I still take it personally. I still ask myself, why did I have to have a crazy stalker who made me want to leave the country? Why? Why did this ruin relationships I had with people? Why did some of my friends lose jobs and ruin their relationships because of this, you know? Why doesn't my boyfriend's family like me still after six years of dating? You know, you have to have an extremely strong sense of self, and most people are unable to not take it personally. And all those years I was writing, I always took it personally. I still take it personally. And to move beyond that takes someone who is mature beyond their years. And maybe this is a you know, controversial thing to, to, to state, but I don't think most young people mm -hmm. are in that position. I think it's fantastic for young writers to write about their experiences as they are coming of age and grappling with these, these issues and are not 100% secure. Because one of the things I was most uncomfortable with was always being labeled a sexpert when I was a 20-something year old who knew nothing about I know. sex Why or life. Why did they life. do that? They did that a lot with me, sexpert, and I was like, you yeah. really, it's not <coughs> accurate. Your one storyline, you know, your one storyline on campus. Um, and I was just able to speak for myself ultimately and that's something that is very liberating when you have an audience that responds to you mm. but it's also a great amount of responsibility and part of the reason why I was unable to stop writing about sex for so long is because I felt that responsibility for my readers mm. 
And that's something that most 20-something year olds cannot handle. So I would just um, keep that in mind because I've been very lucky to have supportive readers, to have supportive friends and everything. But even then, the setbacks I've dealt with have been very, very hard. I would say there's there's something in common with politicians, and I don't, I mean, they get so much crap no matter what they do. And I know it's hard to feel sympathy for politicians, <laughs> but truly, I I do have a place in my heart now for anyone who is even remotely in the public eye. And now, hmm. in 2014, almost all journalists can relate to this on a certain level, whereas I think when we were writing, very few journalists could relate to this, and they, mm-hmm. they I felt as if there were that there were a perspective like I had done something wrong. Now I regularly trade stories with journalists from the New York Times who say, Oh yeah, I got a comment the other day that um, that someone wished that uh, my car blew up with my family in it. You know, <laughs> just another day. Like it's totally normal. And I'm like, wow, I haven't gotten the car blowing up one, but <laughs> okay. So there is a sense, um, I will say uh, uh, it's not progress so much as just an empathy amongst mm-hmm. all people who have read vitriolic comments mm-hmm. online and understand that people are insane. <laughs> they're insane when they're anonymous and they're insane and they, li- they don't like anyone or anything. And so I do think that as a culture, we're starting to understand that and perhaps as we begin to understand that, we will have more empathy for people who are the tall poppies. You know, the tall mm-hmm. poppy syndrome, their head gets whacked off if they're too tall. Um, <laughs> and I, I hope, you know, with the cyberbullying, I mean, I really relate to, to a lot of the experiences of these, these teens who are cyberbullied. And, um, and I, I hope that what we'll do as, as a society is codify some laws and codify some sort of societal um, mandates that, that this bullying of any type to anyone of any age is simply unacceptable and, and I think should be illegal. I really don't think that that's, that should be allowed in this culture. It certainly doesn't help anyone. So that's my perspective on it, but I, it's a constant process. I think you asked, like, what do we do? What are our next steps? Um, I, think, I think you do what you feel you have to do, right? So if you feel like you have to write about sex, you write about sex. But I think more than that, I think especially as women, it's really important that we stop um, degrading sex writers and lifestyle writers to a lower tier than political writers or investigative journalists or sex writers or journalists too, normally. And I think think that's something that we can actively say is like, you know what, I'm gonna stop saying that like the articles in Glamour are mundane. You know, they, a lot of people read the articles in Glamour, and they're very important to a huge subgroup of, or a huge majority of women in this country. And so I think that that's an a active thing we right. can do is stop mm-hmm. categorizing like, oh, if you write about politics on, on the Hill, then you are the best journalist in the world. Well, you know what? Politics on the Hill has just as much sex in it as a sex column. <laughs> so yeah. I think that's, that's something that we have to kind of start saying. I remember just once a New York Times reporter who shall remain unnamed, who I dated for a minute in college. Um, Oops, I guess I sort of identified. Well, anyway. (laughs) (laughs) This is a jerky thing for him to say. He once said to me, he said, Julia, when you want to be a real journalist, let me know. And he was covering politics in Albany. I was like, (laughs) I'm pretty sure more people care about what I'm writing about than what you're writing about. I don't even think you care about that. So, but I agree with you. Yeah. Do we have any more questions? One? All right, you can bring it home, and then we'll, uh, we'll move on to the dining room. It's been fascinating. I, I was at Harvard in the 60s, and uh, c- contraception was illegal for single women. Was uh, it co-ed housing? Uh, n- no, my dear. No. <laughs> I didn't think that. Were you guys in the quad? Like, seniors? <laughs> Oh, it's I, like when you menstruate, you have to go to one woman, area. <laughs> one woman for four men and oh. no women on the faculty. So, oh, wow. you know, I've been alive a long time to have a conversation like this. But several things strike me. Um, because sex was not talked about really in, at all in the way that you're talking about it, I see the change coming perhaps from, I was surprised, when I came back from overseas, herpes was suddenly hit the scene. This is before your time. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, men were scared, and condoms suddenly became interesting. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> never heard about them before because uh, we wouldn't use them for contraception. That's your job. Even if it's illegal, it's your problem. Yeah. Um, and then later, of course, AIDS. I think this changed everything because parents got scared. You, had the, you have to teach them because what, what's going to happen to them? Mm -hmm. They're going to die. And then I also wonder about the role of Dan Savage and his mm -hmm. column. Um, so, so all these things are floating around. But so then it's I Dear also Abby, Ann Landers, well, the well, internet, but, 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 Monica but, Lewinsky. Yeah, yeah there's it's essentially the, the sort of you know Billy Joel you know song version. It's, it's interesting how many kind of maybe figure in or don't. Yeah, yeah. But I also want to point out or mention what hasn't been mentioned here yet is how we use sex to sell everything from yeah. Scotch mm -hmm. tape to colleges, mm -hmm. yeah. and. Uh, I think it's a, a force that is beyond rational discussion. We can be rational about it, but it, 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 we are not rational creatures, whether we're typing anonymous notes or whether we're engaged in, with another person. So those are thoughts I had. And make no mistake, sex is also used to sell student media. You know, yeah. There's absolutely that discussion on how might this drive readers bring in advertisers who are interested in the readers maybe more than you know what they, they'd be aligned with in terms of content. I, you know, I can't speak for, for what the text might be thinking, but I remember having the conversations with the collegiate staff at Penn State, for example, and they, they liked the idea of that being a buzzworthy, you know, eyeball-grabbing feature, along with hopefully having some interesting discussions along the way. But that's, that's definitely part of that discussion on why sex might be a good thing within the student press. I, I have an edgy ex I've never actually said this anywhere publicly, but so, <laughs> put myself out there. So something that was, that came up for me when I was writing was, um, so the Washington Post came to do a story on me, and um, they were going to take pictures, and of course, you know, I'm 21 years old, I want to look hot in the pictures, so I'm wearing like a little schoolgirl skirt, like literally a little schoolgirl skirt, <laughs> like a cleavage bearing top and pearls, I thought I looked great, and I I was pretty cute, I, I will say. But the, there was there was so much there that I didn't know what I was getting myself into. And this is really, I was just an example of what young women who are sexually attractive, they don't know always what they're getting themselves into. And on the one hand, like I had every right to, to wear whatever I wanted and to be seen as whatever I wanted. And on the other hand, I was immediately pigeonholed because of that photograph. Mm -hmm. And part of me liked it. Part of me liked being seen as sexy. I was like, ooh, I'm seen as sexy. This is exciting. I mean, it was a total geek. I was a debater in high school. This was an exciting advance. Um, <laughs> uh, but on the other hand, you know, so there was this like thing, but no one would talk. You couldn't talk about it. You couldn't talk about, oh, I, part of me likes being seen as sexy. I like, you know, these sexy pictures I'm taking. Um, and now what I'm seeing on my Facebook feed, at least from the women my age, so women in their 30s and 40s, they're all getting these boudoir photos taken, and they're very empowered. And the difference with these photographs is the way I'm viewing it is these women are really, like, their sexuality, they're owning it. It's their sexuality, and they're beautiful, and I love looking at these pictures of these women. My sexuality back then, that wasn't what was going on. I was using it to get attention from men, and there was no one around to sit me down and, and sort of guide me through how to do that, and this is still the case, mm -hmm. and this is not talked about. It's like just not talked about, and I, I think we see it in our culture, we talk about it all the time. Ooh, photoshopping of women, and oh, the media only shows thin women, but we don't talk about, well, how do you own your sexuality? Because that's okay, too. It's okay to want to be seen as desirable. But how do you do it in a way that's empowering? I don't have the answers. I just know it's a, something we should talk about. I think every woman should be able to see her cervix, like so many women did back in the sixties. And she went there. Um, <laughs> no, um, I mean, I, I, I think it's, I think it's, I think it's great that the, that 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 we're having this conversation at all. Um, hearing about your experience at Harvard when things were quite so, so different, like it just, it just reminded me, like that's not the only thing that's changed, like co-ed housing and everything, with the advance of women's right, women have been able to make a lot of decisions that they wouldn't have been able to make several decades ago. And this affects like marriage trends, the fact that homosexuality is more acceptable. You know, that affects 
you know, people's views toward the nuclear family unit and all of that. So sex has really become a very um, potent political symbol outside of like the confines of your own bedroom. And I think it's interesting because in the next few years we're going to see how um, the financial crisis and all of these setbacks that is that you know my generation, my friends' generation have experienced, how that's going to affect our choices in terms of partnership, in terms of how we choose to organize our lives. And perhaps if sex becomes less tied to the idea of this is something you do with the intention of one day getting married, or this is something you do only like for the purposes of like reproduction or you know, like once ideas about how we organize our society socially are broken down, our attitudes about sex are also going to change, I'm sure. Um, but we're not going to be able to see the results of that for many years to come. So uh, t to me, it's a continuing conversation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I can't say what it will be like to be having sex on college in like five or 10 years. Maybe people are going to be having much richer, more diverse conversations that are inclusive of all genders, all sexualities, that are conscious of notions like consent and communication. And you know, a lot of it does depend on very brave souls like Kelsey and her writers. Um, and you know, at the same time, it also depends on their peers being supportive, even if they don't know who these people are, being supportive mm -hmm. in um, simply continuing that dialogue beyond the newspaper because ultimately a writer has a platform but the purpose of that platform is not just to tell you about their lives, right? Mm -hmm. It's to start a conversation. Mm -hmm. Lena, I think that's so important and also a great note to end on. Mm -hmm. um, can you guys please help me thank our wonderful panelists? <laughs> for being here. Um, and of course, of course you can uh, pick their brains over some yummy food if you'll join us for our reception in the dining room. Yay.